Uh, there are some some cupcakes and cookies out in the fellowship hall left over from last week for anybody who wants to take them. So they're out there as you leave. Uh, tonight we'll pick up on that uh, pick up back on that lesson series that we started before our gospel meeting. Uh, our title is the biggest word in the New Testament, and this is part two. If you remember the word we designated in this study, and there are some other words that we could have thrown out as, quote, the biggest word. But the one we picked was the little word, if, I-F. So, of course, we're not talking about the word in the New Testament with the most letters, but the word that fits as one of the most important words to understand in all of Scripture. Even though it is a little word, it's a big word. Uh, now, we, we do focus a lot on the grace of God. You know, if I could pick maybe another word, that might be it, because those, these two concepts are working at the same time. Um, as the primary reason that we have an avenue to heaven is because of the grace of God. But what we've been studying is that if mankind does not meet the conditions of God's grace, which is wrapped up in the little word if, then his grace will not benefit us. I'll use a couple of Old Testament examples that Brother Eric Owens recently used in our gospel meeting. They'll be familiar to you. God said to Noah, if you make an ark of gopher wood, then I'll save you from the flood. God said to Rahab and her family, if you enter inside the house of Rahab and put the scarlet cord on the outside of the window, then I'll save you and your house. Israel, if you put the blood on the doorpost, then I will pass over you and I'll save the firstborn of that house. Naaman, if you dip seven times in the Jordan River, then you will be cleansed from your leprosy. So we put it this way, if uh, the word if connects God's promises to man with God's expectations from man. God says, I will uphold my end of the bargain, no doubt. Right? I will never leave you nor forsake you. I'm a sure thing so long as you trust me and you do what I'm asking you to do in faithfulness. And so we started going through a list of times you see if-then statements in our New Testament. So we can kind of piece this together. And you know, what conditional statements are made in the New Testament? that guarantees us a promise or guarantees us a result so long as we meet a certain condition. That's kind of the whole lesson series we're doing here. So tonight we will pick up on number 20 of our list. In our first lesson, we made it through item number 19. So number 20, we'll pick up right where we left off a few weeks ago. Jesus said, if anyone serves me, then my father will honor him. John chapter 12 and verse 26. The idea of receiving honor from God is an interesting one because usually we talk about us giving honor to God. It's hard to think of it in the reverse, that he is going to give honor to us. That's not worship. We're talking about honor. It's interesting to consider that we can live in such a way that God will respect our effort for the way that we live our life. This perfect God, flawless, holy God up in heaven can look down upon us and see acceptance with a group of people. A pride of ownership that he has where God says, I'm proud of that child of mine. They're not perfect, they're not flawless, but based on what they're doing, I'm proud of them. 2 Timothy chapter 2, and 15 tells us that we are to study to present ourselves approved unto God. That is, work hard to figure out how we can be accepted in his realm of safety and what all that entails. Contemplate what things please him and what things do not so that we can figure out how to live the faithful life and the saved life. Acts chapter 10, verse 35 says, But in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. It doesn't matter where you are in the world. If you can follow this way, you can be accepted by God. The Bible really teaches that if you respect God in the proper way, where you trust him, you live a lifestyle to obey him, and do whatever he's told you to do to be saved, and you stay in that condition, you can be accepted by God. 
Abraham was called the friend of God. Enoch uh, was said that he walked with God. These are the same concepts here. That means uh, with Enoch, he was one who was in a very close fellowship with the Father. So John chapter 12, verse 26, has Jesus saying, My Father will honor you if you do what? If you will be my servant. And you lay down the life that you want to live, submit to the life that I want you to live, kind of like we talked about this morning in obeying the gospel. And if you seek obedience, if you seek after all the days of your life loyalty to me and seek faithfulness, worship, then you will be honored by my Father. Romans chapter 2, verses 6 through 10, talks about the two classes of people who are on the earth. Paul said about some that you are treasuring up for yourself wrath. There's this group. Treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day and, or, and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each one according to his deeds. Eternal life to those who by patient continuance and doing good seek for what? Glory, honor, there's our word, and immortality. But to those who are self-seeking, that's a good word for selfish, and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, what is their end? Indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish on every soul of man who does evil, on the Jew first and also of the Greek. But there it is again, glory, honor, and peace to everyone who works what is good to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for there is no partiality with God. Part of what Paul, or, or sorry, part of what we will receive from God at the end of serving Jesus Christ, the Bible says, is honor. And I just want you to contemplate that. He will say, well done, good, faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will now make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Matthew 25, verse 23. Jesus says, God will honor you. Of course, if we honor Christ. So there's the condition. If you honor him, he'll honor you. Number 21. Here's another if-then statement. The Bible says, if Jesus served others, then we ought to serve others. Uh, John chapter 13, verse 14. So if Jesus served, then we ought to serve. So let me ask you, did Jesus serve? Yes, he did. Matthew 20, verse 28. He said, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. Jesus taught us the servant mentality. Serve others, not yourself. Put the needs of others on a pedestal above the needs of yourself. Put the desires of God on a higher pedestal than you put your desires. So that's the mentality that Jesus taught us to have. He said, if I lower myself, you also ought to lower yourself. Luke chapter 14, verse 8, Jesus said, there was this principle, he said, when you, when you are invited by anyone to a wedding feast, for example, do not sit down in the best place. Verse 10 says, but when you are invited, go and sit down in the lowest place so that when he who invited you comes, he may say to you, friend, go up higher. Then you will have glory in the presence of those who sit at the table with you. For whoever exalts himself will be humbled and he who humbles himself will be exalted. So he said, place yourself below everybody else and you'll be honored by God. That is the attitude when we lay down pride and arrogance that we're better than other people. He's saying, have the mentality, nobody is lower than I am. Everyone is higher than me. Jesus taught the mentality of servant. And that's what he did. Jesus bent down and he washed the feet of the disciples. A job that was for a servant. A, disgust, a disgusting job, you might call it. Jesus spent hours healing those who were brought to him, serving, showing uh, the power of God. Jesus worked for people, and he served them. He came to teach how a human being should be, serving others, serving God, and putting self last of all. He said in uh, Acts 20 and verse 35, it was quoted that he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. The idea is 
you might think you'll be happiest when people are serving you. You might be tempted to think that. You now you can picture a rich and a famous person who has people waiting on them hand and foot. And we might think to ourselves, oh, man, that would be the life for people to just be serving us all the time. And that would make me the most happy. But Jesus said, it's actually just the opposite. He said, you will be the happiest if you are serving other people and doing work for them, not only seeking your needs and tending to yourself all the time, self-seeking. You know, many times we get this wrong in the Lord's church, don't we? This mentality might be flip-flop. We say, well, I didn't get anything out of the services tonight. Nobody talked to me. Nobody went out of their way to say hello to me. Nobody asked how I was doing. And then we ask the question, well, did you go out of your way to uplift a brother or a sister? Did you put forth an effort to make someone else feel special when you saw them? Did you sing uh, your heart out and worship to God? How much did you pour into the worship service? The way that it works is you get the most out of these worship services when you put more into it, the more you are engaged. If you think about our thought process when we come together to worship, truly the tier system should be set up this way. It is set up this way. Number one, we should be primarily focused on pouring our hearts out to God in thanksgiving, praise, and worship. God is number one on this system. Number two, we should then focus on edifying our neighbor. So we're focused on God, we're focused on everybody else, and then number three, last of all, we should focus on edifying ourselves. Right? And I guarantee you, if we place the emphasis in that order when we come together, we will be most edified at all of our gatherings when we're focused in that way. Also, it goes for the same way in our daily living if we keep that order. We will be most enriched if we are serving God first, others second, and ourselves third. That's kind of what the Bible teaches about this. For it is more blessed for us to be giving than to receive. Number 22. If the disciples love one another, then the world will know that we are Christ's disciples. John 13, verse 35. Jesus said, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. As I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples, if you have loved one for another. So let's get this straight. The world will know that you are following Christ's teachings and Christ's way if they see what? That the members of the Lord's body love one another. That we love each other. There's nothing more attractive to the people on the outside looking in to what we have here than them seeing us get along in love and harmony with each other. And Colossians chapter 3 and verse 14 calls love the bond of perfection, which holds the church together. People looking into the Lord's body from the outside might not like all the Bible doctrines taught in the midst of the church, but I'll tell you one thing that nobody on earth can find unattractive about the church of Christ is that when they can see us, the members of the Lord's church who are best friends with each other, there's no way that anybody can look at that relationship that Christ drew up, that we treat each other in this way, and nobody can look at that and scoff and say, I don't want anything like that. Nobody's going to look at, at the friendship and the kindness of the body to each other and say, I don't want what the church of Christ has. But I'll tell you uh, what, what will shoo people away from the Lord's body faster than anything is that when they see us not getting along with each other and fighting and bickering and being short with one another, not talking with one another, Jesus says, no, if you will treat each other the right way, if you guys will treat each other right, then that will be most convincing for all those outside to know, oh, these are the followers of Jesus Christ. They're looking at how we treat each other. So the way that we treat each other is so important. 
the way that we work out our problems in the Lord's church and the kindness that we use when we speak to each other, it makes all the difference in the world for how successful we can be as Christ's body. Jesus said, if you love each other, then the world will know that you were sent from me and that you're following me. So I think that's an important principle. Number 23, here's another one. Jesus said, if you do whatever I command you, then you are my friends. John chapter 15 and verse 14. The first thing that popped into my head with this point was how we just mentioned Abraham being called the friend of God. Abraham was called the friend of God. Why do you suppose that Abraham was called the friend of God in the Old Testament? Because we can really see it in Scripture. If you study his life, you can tell why he was called the friend of God. And it was because he did everything that God commanded him to do. When God told Abraham to pack up his bags, leave his homeland, Abraham said, okay, God, I'll do that. And when God told Abraham to offer his beloved son Isaac on the altar, Abraham said, okay, God, I'll do that. Hebrews 11 verse 19 says, concluding that God was able to raise Isaac up even from the dead if he actually had to kill him. So yes, everything that God said to Abraham, number one, Abraham believed it, that it was true. Number two, Abraham did his best to obey it and to perform it. So no, Abraham was not perfect, but he was called a friend of God because he sought to do whatever God was asking him to do to the very best of his ability. So he was faithful. And you might put it this way, he pursued the attributes of the divine nature. That's why Abraham was his friend, because he was pursuing him with all of his might. Abraham trusted in God, that God's purity was higher than his. God's righteousness was more righteous than his. And God's wisdom was greater than his. Therefore, Abraham didn't question. Whenever God told him to do something, he just did it. So whatever God asked Abraham to do, he did. And that's exactly what Jesus tells you and he tells me. He says, if you will do whatever I command you, then you can be called my friend. You'll be the friend of God too. If you just do whatever he's commanding you to do to the very best of your ability, don't ignore any of the commands, don't try to put some under the rug, you can be the friend of God. We can all be the friends of God. Greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. So many people want to call themselves a friend of Jesus in today's day and age and in the religious world, but they don't follow everything he said. They're not trying to follow everything he said. More so picking and choosing. I like this part, so I'll follow it. I like this part, so I'll follow it. Some say in their life, I'm a friend of Jesus but they don't love their neighbor as their self. Some say, I'm, I'm a friend of Jesus, but I don't worship in spirit and in truth. I'm a friend of Jesus, but I refuse to be joined to his body, which is his church, the church of Christ, but I'm a friend of Jesus. I'm a friend of Jesus, and yet I sin more and more that grace may abound. Uh, Romans chapter 6 and verse 1. Yes, yeah, so many people want to call themselves a friend of the Godhead, but they don't follow the Godhead's conditions for them to be called the friend of God, like Abraham. It says, you are my friends if. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. I like how Eric Owens uh, talked about Balaam's request to die the death of a righteous man. Numbers chapter 23 and verse 10. He said, let me die the death of the righteous and let my end be like his. A request made by a wicked man, who the text says, love the wages of unrighteousness. He said, I want to die like a righteous man dies. But the point is very simple about Balaam. You cannot die the death of a righteous man if you're a wicked man. And in the same way, you come to the New Testament time period, and we have people saying, I'm a friend of Jesus, and I want the reward of Jesus' friends. And yet... They don't follow a word that he says. Can't have one without the other. No, being called a friend of Jesus or a friend of God is dependent upon seeking faithful obedience to every command that he gives. To the very best of our ability, we're trying to follow everything he said. If we ignore his commands, 
or even if we ignore part of his commands, then we cannot be found faithful, as we were talking about Thursday night, about walking in the light. You can't be found walking in the light, ignoring part of his commands and knowing so, and not willing to submit to him. I'll be a friend to Jesus, and he say, and it means I'll try my best to obey everything that he's asked. That's how you can be his friend. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20 says, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to do what? Observe all things that I have commanded you. So it's not just a one and done. You teach them the gospel, you uh, baptize them into Christ, and then you teach them to observe the life that he's called us to live. Observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. We talked in the gospel meeting about being found faithful as a condition for the saved, and that as long as you are being found faithful, then you are still saved. Being found faithful, according to Matthew chapter 28 and verse 20, is defined as giving adherence, dedicating your life to observing all things, commanded by Jesus Christ. What happens if we stop observing all things to the best of our ability? We transfer ourselves from the light and into the darkness if we start living that life. So that's what faithfulness means. Does that mean that we'll never mess up? No. But does it mean the overarching theme of our life is observing Christ's every command to our diligence? That's what faithfulness means. The moment the Christians start ignoring the commands of Jesus Christ and stopped attempting to make things right in their life. They stopped giving attention to where they fall short. They stopped going to God in prayer and confessing and admitting their sins. They start using the grace of God as a license to sin and they're trying to hide their sin. That is when Christians start getting into the realm of apostasy. Right? And people can be apostate Christians and still be gathering at the assemblies every week. Jesus said, you are my friends so long as you give your diligence to do my commands. That's when you're my friends and that's who I'm going to save. You are my friends so long as you do whatever I command you. Number 24. Jesus also said this in John 15 verse 19. If you were of the world, then the world would love its own. The world would love you if you acted like the world. So Jesus said, if you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. So here we're talking about the world rejecting followers of Jesus Christ as an outcome. Essentially, Christ is saying, as an evidence that you are following me truly, you will notice that the world does not accept you. You are ridiculed, you are made fun of, you are mocked, for following after me. And when you stand in the areas where I told you to stand, and you do what I told you to do, when you teach the way I told you to teach, even through the apostles and the Holy Spirit, the vast majority of people will not like you for what you're standing for. As a matter of fact, many will hate you for my name's sake. But don't be alarmed, Jesus said, because they hated me too. The Son of God they hated. You know, I'll tell you one way to make, uh, to make you more likable. You want to be likable by the world standard. You want people out there to like you. Here's what you do. Don't tell somebody what the Bible says that would conflict with the lifestyle they're living. You, if, if you want everyone to like you, don't talk against their lifestyle. If you want the world to like you, don't teach them that God hates divorce. Don't just zip your lips. They'll like you for it. If you want the world to like you, don't teach that living together before marriage is wrong. If you want the world to like you, then don't teach that there's only one church because those in other churches will be offended by that message. Don't teach that it's wrong to drink alcohol. Don't teach that it's wrong to use curse words and swear words or to use God's name in vain. Don't teach against homosexuality in this day and age, gambling, uh, modern dancing and the lasciviousness that takes place at these events, immodesty. Don't talk about those things if you want the world to love you. You see, when you start relaying heaven's standard of holiness and purity in this fleshly society, 
then they're going to hate you for what you're saying because you're relaying the message from heaven. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 4 says, In regard to these, they think it's strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation, speaking evil of you. They're not going to like you. They're going to talk bad about each one of us in this room if we're standing where Christ told us to stand. The world is going to be uh, considering you as a follower of Christ as judgmental when in fact you are just relaying what God said. The world is going to consider you maybe a goody two-shoes, a holy roller, or you're a religious fanatic. Someone says, you know, they think just because they go to church four times a week that they're better than all of us. And that's not what we're saying at all. But they'll accuse us of arrogance because we try to live the right way and we're trying to promote the right way. So they'll accuse us of all sorts of things. But in Matthew chapter 5, verses 10 through 12, Jesus says about his true followers, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Jesus' point is, if you are accepted by the world, then you're probably not following me. If, if, if this doesn't happen, if you're not persecuted at all and nobody ever gives you any resistance, then that's probably proof that we're not following Christ. All those who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But if you relay my message and you stand where I told you to stand, even though they don't like it, then there's no way that everyone in this world is going to be happy with you. They're going to hate you. Many will be upset with you for what you teach and where you stand because you follow Jesus Christ. He said, I didn't come to bring peace on earth. I came to bring a sword, division. James chapter 4, verse 4 puts it this way. Friendship with the world is enmity with God. Many people try so hard not to offend the world because they only want to be friends with the world. They don't, want, they don't want this lack of relationship. They don't want to speak the true message of God because they don't want to make enemies of those outside the world or those in the world. But the Bible says you're either going to be, A, an enemy of the world and a friend of God, or you're going to be a friend of God, friend of God and an enemy of the world. So that means you cannot be a friend of God and a friend of the world at the same time in the sense in which we're talking about. That doesn't mean we can't be friends with the world, friendly with the world. So I would, I would rather let everybody know what God's standard is, reach the day of judgment, and they say to themselves, well, Travis told me, <coughs> Betty told me, right? plug our names in. We'll, have, we'll, we'll be able to answer on that day. Say, I, I told everybody that I was close to what this standard was. I did it lovingly. And I'm, I'm fine with that. I don't want anybody to go to hell, but I'd rather them be my friends in heaven than friends down here. Uh, number 25. Here's another if-then statement. Coming from Acts chapter 8, verse 37. If you believe with all your heart, then you may be baptized. I think this is a good one. Philip had just preached the gospel to the eunuch, and he asked, what is stopping me from being baptized? In other words, I'm interested in baptism. As you've just stated, Philip, is there anything getting in my way from being saved? There's water. What hinders me from being baptized? And in essence, Philip said, there's nothing getting in your way. So long as you do what? Believe with all your heart. You may. Acts chapter 8, and verse 37. So long as you believe, then you are a candidate for baptism. Now, why do I bring this up as a significant verse in today's day and age? Because there are many religious people who baptize a certain group who are not candidates for baptism. What is this certain group uh, that does not qualify for baptism that I'm talking about? I'm talking about infant baptism. The baptism of babies, according to this verse. I want you to think about it. All over the world, certain religious religions of both uh, Catholic and Protestant denominations baptize infants. 
Some do it for various reasons. A lot of it's to forgive them of original sin, which the Bible doesn't teach about. But listen, you cannot baptize an individual who doesn't believe the gospel. All right, Philip said by the Holy Spirit, you can be baptized if there's a condition. You believe with all your heart. A baby can't believe, let alone believe with all their heart. All right, furthermore, we would also add a baby cannot repent, which is necessary before you baptize somebody. A baby can't confess the name of Christ, which is necessary before you baptize somebody. A baby cannot hear and understand the message of the gospel. And so the, the method of saving a lost soul cannot be followed by a baby or an infant. When you, duck, when you dunk a baby in water, they have no more of a right to be baptized than an atheist because they cannot believe the message. Someone says, well, how then can a baby be saved? Well, how about this? A baby's not lost. Right? You only baptize someone who, first off, is lost in their sins. A baby's not. Furthermore, you only baptize someone who realizes there's their loss. A baby doesn't realize anything. You only baptize someone who believes in the gospel. You only baptize someone who is willing to repent of their sins. You only baptize someone who's willing to make a confession of the name of Jesus Christ. And unless those conditions can be met, a soul is not a candidate for baptism. You can't baptize someone who can't do the preceding steps. And if they can't, if they're not able, odds are they're not lost in the first place. Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, then you may. But you know, if you do not believe or cannot believe, then you may not be baptized. I'll say it again. A baby has no more of a right to be baptized than an atheist. Because if belief is excluded, you may not be baptized according to the scripture. And the problem with baby baptism is that you have a bunch of people who are taught when they're older that they don't need baptism. Why? Well, because you did it when you were younger. We baptized you. Better yet, it was done for you when you were younger. Now you don't need to do it now that you're older. That's dangerous. That's leading people in the wrong way. But the Bible also teaches against that principle. Now, baptism is submitting to the will of God of your own volition. Name one time in Scripture where someone was baptized where it wasn't their choice to be baptized in water. Right? You can't baptize somebody when they don't choose to. If I go up to an atheist in a pool and say, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, that, that's not going to save them. It's a calling on the name of the Lord. They have to understand. They have to be making the decision. A baby can't do that. Number 26. Another if-then statement, Romans chapter 8, and verse 13. The Bible says to Christians, If you live after the flesh, then you shall die. So Paul says, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So this is talking about the sinful lifestyle that we cannot live and be counted faithful and go to heaven. First uh, John chapter 1, verse 6 calls it walking in darkness versus uh, walking in the light, First John 1, 7. Living after the flesh means living a lifestyle tending to the wants and desires of your flesh, not regarding what your spirit needs. Romans chapter 6, verses 1 and 2 refers to it as sinning more and more that grace may abound, God forbid. The, the way of, uh, this way of living violates the laws of God freely and continuously. This is a lifestyle where someone has forfeited trying to live according to the spirit standard. Kind of, you could say, they're not really trying. They're not actually trying to keep the holy standard. Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 and 8, Paul says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will reap of the flesh corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap eternal or everlasting life. So if you live this life that we're talking about, then you will meet eternal condemnation as your end. But if you live this life, then you will meet eternal life as your end. It depends on how you live, the lifestyle you pursue. If you live according to the flesh, then you will be separated from God in the end if you keep performing that pursuit of action. So it shows the holy lifestyle that we are called to live. 
We must walk worthy of the calling with which we are called, Ephesians 4 and verse 1. Number 27. It's another very simple one, but the Bible says, If you believe and confess, then you shall be saved, Romans chapter 10 and verse 9. So again, we talked about these, uh, these two points as essential conditions of being added into Christ's body. Right? If anyone is only baptized without belief or without confession, they will not be saved. The eunuch made that great confession, Acts chapter 8 and verse 37. He said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Number 28, if you do not continue in his goodness, then you will be cut off. Romans chapter 11 and verse 22. We talked about this promise, or about this prominent verse in lesson one a few weeks ago about the lifestyle of a Christian. So Paul says, therefore, consider the goodness and severity of God. On those who fell, they got severity. But toward you, goodness. If you continue in his goodness, Otherwise, you also will be cut off. If you don't want to be cut off from God, then what must there be in your life? Well, this verse says a continuance in his goodness. Otherwise, you will be cut off. Persisting in faithful living in the ways of God. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. So if that attempt stops and you quit trying, and you turn back to living a life of darkness, or you're trying to claim that you're living this way, but you're secretly living another way, you will be cut off. God will know it if you're not continuing in his goodness. So can a Christian live just any old way that they want to live, come to church on Sunday, and still be classified as, hey, I get my continual cleansing because I'm walking in the light? No, you can't just live any way you want to live. Faithfulness must be upheld. So although perfection is not attainable, faithfulness certainly is attainable. Number 29, we'll close with this one for sake of time on our list tonight. If you do not act in faith, then it is sin. Romans chapter 14 and verse 23. In Romans 14, Paul talks about the topic of eating certain foods as a matter of the conscience. And if something violates your conscience, then you shouldn't do it. Paul says in this passage, it is good neither to eat meat nor drink wine, and that's just anything that comes from the grape, nor to drink wine, to do anything by which your brother stumbles or is offended or made weak. Do you have faith? Have it to yourself before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself and what he approves. Now listen to verse 23. But he who doubts is condemned if he eats because he does not eat from faith. For whatever is not from faith is sin. Now, that's an important principle for us to understand in our daily life. It might apply differently to different things in your life. This Christian brother that we're talking about, who had a personal conscience issue with eating meats in the first century, was told, then don't do it if you can't do it in faith. Right, if you can't do something in full confidence of faith, but you are doubting in some way whether or not you should do this thing, then don't do it. James chapter 4 and verse 17 says similar, similarly, uh, Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does it not, to him it is sin. Right, the, the, con the concept means we must not only be aware of what the Scripture says, but we also must pay attention to our personal conscience in deciphering right versus wrong. Don't violate your conscience. God's word helps to shed light, of course, but the natural conscience that is inside man does too. All right, Romans chapter 2 and verse 15 talks about the ancient Gentiles who obeyed God's laws, which bore them witness, but listen to what also he says. He says, their conscience also bearing witness. And between themselves, their thoughts accusing or else excusing them. So this verse talks about how mankind has a conscience inside them to help distinguish right from wrong. And if you have a conscience issue with anything, then you are sinning if you violate your own conscience. And it might be slightly different from person to person. It's a law within yourself. 
So eating meat in the first century was a good example of this. It's one you see throughout the New Testament that they were dealing with, but it's the principle. Uh, One brother could in all good conscience eat meat, which the Old Testament had forbidden. Why? Because they knew, well, the old law is nailed to the cross. We can eat these, these meats that were previously forbidden. But other brethren, they couldn't bring themselves to do it when they became a Christian. They said, I was raised my whole life not being able to eat pork or eat shellfish. I just can't in all good conscience do it. Paul says, don't. It, he who eats uh, without faith is condemned if he eats. So their conscience was so programmed to see this action as wrong, even though they had freedom to do it, their conscience told them it was wrong. Therefore, they were told, yes, if it violates your personal conscience, then don't do it or else it is sin. So we, mean, we must be conscious of our conscience and understand this concept. Uh, So that's all we have time for tonight. Uh, We'll keep going with this list of the if-then statements of Scripture and how powerful these things are. We've got to keep God's conditions if we want to be found faithful. Uh, So the Bible says if you're not part of the Lord's body, here's how you become a member of the Lord's church. Have your sins washed away through obedience to the gospel. You have to hear the gospel, believe it, that Jesus Christ died, rose again the third day, for your sanctification, that you can have access to the Father if you believe that, repent of your sins, confess Him before men, and be baptized in water for the forgiveness of those sins. The Lord adds you to His church. He asks you as a commandment, as a requirement, just be faithful until the day you die. You don't have to be perfect, but give your due diligence to everything that's written in this book. And if you're trying your very best and you are walking in the light, you will continue to be cleansed until the day that you die as you admit and repent of your wrong. So if anybody uh, has anything to come forward for, you can obey the gospel tonight or you can repent of any sin. Uh, Please come while we stand and sing. Come to the Savior, make